to the book of Psalms 110. Psalms 110. So the question for yesterday's presentation was, what air do you breathe? And we saw a personality yesterday, Jehovah Elohim, who happens to be the pre-incarnate identity of the Christ. He was the one that stepped out of the quadrant of the Godhead. And he was the one that performed an act of modeling. For the Bible says he made man from the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Hallelujah. And we saw that on the basis of the investment of the breath of life, you could conveniently live out your life on the basis of that investment. And if there's anybody that is not yet born again, such a person is still operating from the investment of the bread of life. What the bread of life did was that he established the seat of our intellect. It established our soulish consciousness, that is, our emotional framework, so that we are no longer robots, but we can respond, we can feel. Um, it established our capacity for convictions and choices. And this was what the breath of life imparted. Since we are creatures that were designed to exercise dominion, there is a scope of dominion that is possible on the basis of the breath of life. And that's why the richest man in Africa is not here. He's, he believes something else. It is the resources of the breath of life that he has galvanized to attain his status as the richest man in Africa. There's a scope of dominion that you can explore on the basis of that fundamental investment, the breath of life. We also saw yesterday that the same Jehovah Elohim, when he was manifested as a man upon the face of the earth, he finished his ministry, which was to satisfy his earthly ministry, which was to satisfy the claims of divine justice. And through the principle and the strategy of substitution, paved the way for humankind to be able to inherit the glory of God. For the Bible says that all have sinned and have become dwarfs with respect to the glory of God. So Jesus came and he satisfied the requirement of the justice system of heaven to release man from the sentence that he was under so that man can fulfill his original destiny and the habitat, the habitat, the actual habitat for man to function in just like water is to fish is glory. So we are creatures that are destined to function in full capacity under the reinforcement of glory. And the person of glory happens to be the person of the Spirit of God. And so when Jesus finished his work of redemption upon his resurrection, he, may, he gave a charge. As the Father has sent me, so send I you, the same Jehovah Elohim, and he breathed on them. That was the second layer of breath. But this time, it was not the breath of life. He breathed on them and said, what? Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So dominion at this second level of breath, it's a different matter from the first level. 
And I was trying so hard yesterday to open our understanding to the implication of the second breath. And I, I, I showed us that it is the basis upon which our spiritual senses are mobilized for us to have the ability of perception to um, know the things that are obtainable in the kingdom of God. That's Jesus saying that in the book of John chapter 3. For in John chapter 3, he told Nicodemus, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again. And the meaning, the organic meaning of being born again is that the Spirit of God becomes the umpire of your heart. He influences your heart. He builds his, his government on your heart. And the moment the presence of the Holy Spirit is factored upon your heart, Jesus is saying the true experiential definition of the fact that you have been regenerated in your spirit is that your spiritual senses will become functional. Your receptacle, the organ with which you can receive the transmissions coming from the realm of God will become functional. So if you are born again and your spiritual senses are not functional, it means you are not living up to the full potential and the full possibility of the blessing that God has made available to you. And when your spiritual senses are not functional, it means you have a challenge with perception, with perceiving what God is doing, with perceiving what God requires from you, with perceiving where God is leading you. And your life, because of this handicap, is still going to be lived on the basis of the first breath. So we still have believers that are born again, but yet they are not living to the full potential of that status just because they have refused to maximize the oppression of Christ that is in their spirit. Are you there? As much as God is sovereign, as much as God is omnipotent, as much as God can do all things indeed, if you study the book of Colossians, you are going to find that we have a part to play in our walk with God. Uh, the Bible reveals that it's our own responsibility to ensure that we become grounded. Grounded. That's the kind of thing that God told Abraham when he said, I am the El Shaddai. But walk thou before me and be thou perfect. And I will make a covenant between me and thee. Grounded. So Abraham will have to take the revelation of God as El Shaddai which means the strong, the, 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 um, the multi-breasted, the one that sustains all and is sustained by none, the one whose strength supersedes any circumstance, any situation, and he can turn it over. So, so for the El Shaddai, there is nothing called impossible. It's within the scope of God as the El Shaddai that impossibilities do not exist. Because of his strength, he can turn the hand of barrenness. He can, and it will interest you to know that he took three generations to adequately inculcate the efficacy of his dimension as El Shaddai. He revealed himself to Abraham as El Shaddai, revealed himself to Isaac as El Shaddai, revealed himself to Jacob as El Shaddai. In the life of Abraham, what El Shaddai did was that he overcame barrenness, he overcame menopause, and he also overcame the fact that Abraham's natural capacity for reproduction had suffered serious loss because of the number of winters that he had seen. So the winters had preyed upon him. And his ability to um, be virile was affected by time. And when El Shaddai came, he reversed the protocol of biology. He released Sarah's womb from captivity. 
And it will interest you to know that the reason why Sarah was barren was because they defied a fertility spirit called sin in the land of all of the Chaldees. And I don't have time to go into all of that perspective to show you how vicious that spirit actually is. They pray to the spirit for women to become pregnant. They pray to the spirit for cattle to become pregnant. They pray to the spirit for the earth to yield. And Abraham and his family was situated within the heart of the priesthood that was in that family, in that nation. And that was why it was easy for him to know that a voice was speaking to him because he's heard other spiritual voices before. So when he turned his back on that spirit, the first evidence was the barrenness of his wife. So when the El Shaddai came, the only way he could prove to Abraham that he was strong was that he had the ability to undo what that spirit did. In the case of Isaac, he did not, yeah, he passed through some challenges of childbirth, but that was not the major challenge of Hallelujah. That wasn't a major challenge of his destiny. For him, the major challenge was famine. And when the situation of famine came and the, um, the trend of famine was, could be predictable. Because if you notice in the days of Abraham, there was famine in that same land. And then in the days of Isaac, there was famine. That means it was, there was a cyclical situation that occasioned uh, this famine. And the guy wanted to follow the example of his father to go to Egypt uh, for sustenance during the time of that famine. And unknown to him, Abraham went into uh, Egypt in violation of the counsel of God. And it took the mercy of God to bring him back in one piece, bring his wife back, because his wife was already in the palace of... I don't want to go into all of that. It took God's faithfulness to... Even though he was in covenant relationship with Abraham, Abraham was not faithful to the covenant. Abraham was looking for how to survive, how to... He became so smart. He felt he was smarter than God, that God was too slow. So he attempted to help God, and he found himself almost contending with Pharaoh. And uh, he took his covenant partner that he was not faithful to, to go and appear to Pharaoh in the dream and say, right now, the way you are now, you are dead. <laughs> and there was a great temptation for Isaac to follow the strategy of his father in seeking some form of rebate in, uh, in Egypt. And then the Holy Ghost spoke to him. That he should not go to Egypt, that he should abide in that land and sow in that land. Imagine a man sowing in dry season. He sowed in dry season and the Bible says in that same year he ripped an hundredfold. He became great. So his strength was the strength of a nation. So kings around him were threatened by the kind of greatness that that economic boom brought to him. It was famine that El Shaddai conquered in the life of Isaac. And in the life of Jacob, he, you know the story of how he escaped with his, the transaction of taking over his brother's birthright. And he escaped. The only property he escaped with was his staff. So his problem was poverty. <laughs> And the El Shaddai handled the, the menace of poverty in the life of Jacob and made him a great nation. Now, so, are you there? So when we talk about the El Shaddai, it's, we're talking about the strong, we're talking about the multi-breasted we are talking about the one that can sustain all and the one that is sustained by none if it is true that you have received the second breath 
you should begin to see symptoms of the El Shaddai at work in your life. It happens to be that the El Shaddai is not flesh and bone. The El Shaddai is spirit. If you have read your Bible, maybe you go to the book of Psalms, you study the book of Psalms, chapter 8. You are going to see, because the subject of Psalms, chapter 8, verse 4, is what man is. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him. Uh, the, and I don't want to go into how this question came about because it is going to take our time. But if you read from verse 5, you will find that the person that is asking this question is not ignorant. He's not asking out of ignorance. He's asking, he's not an ignoramus. He's very, very equipped with knowledge. But there are two things about man that he is still confusing. Why God was mindful of man and why God visits man. God has a calendar of visitation for humankind that he is strictly committed to. That's the reason for... Now, let me show you the knowledge the person has uh, even before the question was asked. He said, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Stop there. If you click on angels and you have a lexicon, you find out that the word there is Elohim, not Elohim. So this verse 5 gives us an idea of the organogram of the universe. Um, so we have God, the greatest order of divinity in the apex of this schematic. Then we now have visible realm here. We have invisible realm here. Are you there? Then, in this visible realm, what this is saying is that the next in rank, the second person in the organogram, is man. So for you have made him a little lower than the Elohim. Okay, what translation is this? Aha, so this translation, new living translation, picks it straight from the lexicon. And the substitution is already done there. You have made only, you have made them only a little lower than God and has crowned them with glory and honor. All right? Now, you see, one thing I don't want you to miss here is that, are you there? So according to the organogram, we have God first. Then we have man is number two. And man functions within the scope of the physical realm. Then number three in rank, this man and this number three personalities called angels. The angels function in the invisible realm. Man functions in the visible realm. But both man and angels are agencies, agents of service to Now, you see, hi, let me, let me not trouble you. Let's just stay with the scripture. You have made him a little lower than the Elohim and has crowned him with glory and honor. I need to draw your attention to the fact that this creature called man is crowned. Don't forget it. If he doesn't have a crown, it's not man. It's a crowned being. And it will interest you to know that the word crown in this scripture is not like what you are thinking now, the crown we wear on the head. No. It's a medallion for athletes. You know when someone is involved in a race and he wins the race, he is crowned winner with what? A medal. You there? Okay, since you are not there, I'll just leave. Don't worry, it's okay. I'm trying to explain, but... Uh, all right, we'll just leave that for now. When, when you are back from anywhere you are, we will... Uh, no, that one is gone. This one is gone. 
Um, so we saw that uh, Jesus released into them the, the breath of the Holy Spirit. The breath of the Holy Spirit. That was when the disciples became born again. Because he released into them himself as in form of the Holy Spirit. He, revealed, he released into them himself as the Holy Spirit. So if you are dealing with the Holy Spirit, the person you are hearing, the person that is prompting you is Jesus the Christ because he's the one dwelling in you as the Holy Spirit. For Jesus, when he was sent from heaven, it was his father that was dwelling in him as the Holy Spirit. So he was relating with his father and he could relate with his father because of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus was speaking to us about the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when he comes, he will glorify me. It's just like, if you check the word glorify, it's just like uh, we're using PA system here. And this PA system is amplifying the things that I'm saying. It, that, that's this, a similar word, it's amplifying. I, I personally don't have a loud voice, so you need to have good PA system to even pick what I'm saying in the first place. And the reason why you can hear me is because this one is good. All right, so if your PA system is not good, you are not likely to hear me because I don't have a loud voice. So the Holy Spirit is saying that Jesus will be speaking, but you will not be able to hear him. I am the PA system. I have systems in place that will make it easy for you to pick his voice. So the activity of the Spirit of God inside of your heart makes it possible for you to pick the frequencies of God. Are you there? He says he will glorify me. So it's still Jesus that has the office. But what makes the office efficacious in your life? The office of the Christ. What makes his office efficacious in your life is the person of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you the connection in a moment of time so that you will understand what we are talking about. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. I took you to the book of, uh, of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and I showed you now, Paul made a few statements. I don't know if I read it yesterday. Apostle Paul, he made a few statements. Uh, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. As I read to us. From verse 6 to verse 11. How be it, brethren, we speak wisdom among they that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So, then what is the name of such things that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard, that has not occurred in the heart of man that's what we call mystery. Mystery. It is beyond our learning capacity. It's beyond our knowing capacity. So there are things in God that you cannot study in a book. There are things in God that you cannot learn in a library. There are things in God that you cannot know in a lecture. 
Those things are custom made and they'll be handed out to you by the Holy Spirit himself. So it is the Holy Spirit that is the custodian of the depths of God. If you study your Bible critically, you must have seen uh, the miscalculations of the devil many times. One of such miscalculations is what the Bible speaks about when it said, if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified the God of glory. They felt that Jesus was a threat. You know, Satan, if he has an opportunity, he wants to hide the fact that his kingdom is subordinate to the authority of God. And so one of the things that Satan will want to hide the most is to see a situation where someone exercises the authority of the kingdom of God and he expels devils. Because that is a very powerful illustration of how weak his kingdom is. So Satan would do anything to hide that. So he felt that Jesus, anywhere he went, he just displaces devils and makes people whole from sickness. And it was beginning to register that his kingdom was not as powerful as the publicity that he had made. So he felt Jesus needed to be taken out quickly. Unfortunately for him, um, he thought he killed Jesus, but he only set him free. He set him free from his own physical body, and he became the life-giving spirit. So that anyone that, by any means, decides to put his faith in him, he possesses them. Hallelujah. So his spirit now begins to produce the same capacity of Jesus in the life of that individual. So now Satan has to deal with so many Jesuses in the territory. So it would have been better for him to allow Jesus to grow old. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you will notice that the Bible is full of many miscalculations of the devil. He's likely to miscalculate because he doesn't know the capacity that is in the Holy Ghost. There were several secrets that were put in place before Satan was created. Because Satan is a created, let's start with Lucifer, was a created being. Huh? God created Lucifer. Lucifer decided to become Satan. Just like God created you and me. We can decide to become arm robbers. God did not create an arm robber. The arm robber was created by our choices. Okay, so I just wanted to balance that. Um, so many secrets were held up in God before creation started. And uh, the experience that Satan has is based on the things he became acquainted with after his creation. But nothing began with creation. Because God was never created. He is existence himself. He's the one that makes heaven significant. He is the significance of heaven. All right? So you will see miscalculations, miscalculations, because Satan is using the parameters of experience that he has secured by reason of the fact that he is relatively an ancient in the realm. So he knows a few things, and he, he's worked closely with God before. The things he does are just attempts to mimic the things he has seen in the kingdom of God. If you see the structure of his kingdom, if you see the layout of his kingdom, if you see how he um, um, dispatches his functionaries, I can show you equivalents of that in the kingdom of light. So... Satan, okay, like the Bible says, no weapon formed against you. Satan works with some level of precision. He designs custom-made bondages. Because if a weapon is to be formed, there will be specifications. Hallelujah. So, he, he, he has taken some readings from your life. He has seen some cycles around your life. He knows the cycles around your father's life. He has 
the cycles around your grandfather's life. So he builds a weapon with the information he has gathered concerning the cycles that he has seen. That kind of a weapon is supposed to be so custom made that it will not have any possibility of failure. But you see, the only thing the devil does not know is the capacity of the Holy Ghost that is in you. You know, I told you, because you were not ready for that, my scripture. So I was trying to show you the meaning of medallion. Because man, by design, was supposed to be a crowned entity. And the crown is not the head crown. The crown is the heart crown. So the Bible says that he's crowned with glory. And it is because he's crowned with glory that he becomes a creature of honor. And that glory, the, the person of glory is the Holy Ghost. So from the design of man, it is supposed to be man plus Holy Ghost that creates that super creature that is a, a representation, a, an ambassador from the kingdom of heaven. Are you there? For instance, there are many scriptures like uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 26 where the Bible says it is the spirit. No, give me Romans. Hey, my scriptures have. Romans, aha. Uh -huh. No, no. Romans 8 26. I've, okay. All right. So the Bible says, likewise, the Spirit also helped our infirmities. That means God created us deliberately with weaknesses. He created us with infirmities, created us with shortcomings. Yeah, somebody's telling me that, that you know, but, but I made the first class. I, I don't think I am so limited. Now, your limitation is that your first class that you make. <laughs> as much as, <laughs> hallelujah. That, is, that first class, if, if you are the one saying that, is the limitation that you have accepted that first class as a means of rejecting the help that is in the Holy Ghost. So your first class has now constituted your current scope of limitation. God that created us said, that we are limited, we are, we are handicapped. And he did that deliberately so that none of us will look to ourselves, resources to contend with issues that are orchestrated from the realm of the spirit. You will never know that you are limited until you have a challenge that is, is caused by devils. Then your first class will count for nothing. You forget where you kept your certificate. It messes up the, 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 the environment. So the Bible says that God helps our infirmities by the Spirit. So in the eyes of God, you are not a complete man until you have the Spirit on your life. And that is the formation that uh, the, the psalmist saw in the book of Psalms 8, where he said you are crowned with the medallion of the Holy Ghost. It's a description of a New Testament believer that has the Holy Spirit factored into him. It's not an experience that the Old Testament believer can, can talk about. Because in the Old Testament, God is a creator and a spectator. As you see him in the book of Genesis, he will create something, then he will stand back and assess it and see that it is good. But in the New Testament, God is factored in his creation namely man that's a mystery the old testament saint cannot understand that but it is through the holy ghost that is in that vessel that human vessel that it swallows up every infirmity so if we see your life and we categorize your life and we see that infirmities rule over you it means you have not yet tapped into the facility of the second breath even though you have the breath, but you are not living by it. The, the, the challenge with believers is that they cannot tap into the spiritual resources that the Lord has made available for them. Hallelujah. If only you know the capacity of the Holy Ghost. It is because of the capacity of the Holy Spirit that the devil cannot really measure. That's the reason why the Bible is full of many miscalculations of the devil. If the princes of this world had known. That's a sign of 
a sound of regret would have left this man, would have allowed him. Now Jangfa has come. Bridget has come. As he's trying to tackle, and you know, the angels that went with him, their number has not increased. They have not, there's, there's no reproductive system to ensure that, okay, their numbers, in, it's still the same number of fallen angels that are working with him since that time till now. And human population is increasing. That means it's, it's becoming more difficult to keep track of, of, of things. <laughs> <laughs> his resources have become, are depleted. And that's why his major agenda for keeping us under his control is deception. Because he doesn't have the resources to manage us, all of us individually, so he casts a, a, a spell of deception upon, upon the nations of the world. Miscalculations exist because he doesn't have a unit of measurement to measure the capacity of the Holy Ghost. Now, that means you should spend more time exploring the Holy Ghost, knowing him more than demons. Meanwhile, don't, don't get it wrong. Though. Demons exist. And they hate you on Monday, Tuesday. They are looking for... If you see just, uh, uh, Satan appear, he might be wearing dark goggles. He's not trying to take selfie. He came to kill you. <laughs> All right. Are you there? So there are miscalculations because he cannot fathom the capacity of this personality called the Holy Ghost. And in the new creation economy, he factors the Holy Spirit with us under the policy of what we call the economy of the mingled spirit, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. So he's mingled with your regenerated spirit. That means he can hear your desires. Are you, are you there? When you think, your thoughts echo into his realm like loudspeakers. Can hear your thoughts. He can hear your desires. And he can speak through your thoughts. Are you there? He, 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 he's so close. He's so close. He's so close. He's so blended with you that in your spirit that is very difficult for you to find the boundary that's how factor the is with your life but i need to show you a few things before i move to number three the third breath because we have the, what i'm doing is a recap just to bring you back M many of you were in the market yesterday as i was talking you were still buying and selling transacting it was difficult to get to you so I decided today that I will not go straight to my sermon. I will be talking about the old one until I feel that you have come back from the place you strayed to in your mind. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you still there? Yes, so the Holy Ghost is, is mingled with your spirit. And until you begin to learn how to exercise your spirit, the same way you have to exercise your mind in order for you to get a degree. And when you exercise your mind, the university community acknowledge that you are disciplined enough in the knowledge of chemistry to be called a chemist. If you are brought into a committee and they need chemical solutions, as a man that has received that level of discipline, you should be able to say one or two things that will be strategic. Because you went into the class for four years, you were in the lab for four years, and after some time, you began to think according to the philosophy of chemistry. Are you there? Well, the reason why I'm saying chemistry is because that is the area of my own expertise. Hallelujah. Uh, but you see, even after exercising your soul, if you refuse to exercise your spirit, the investment that God makes available, the spiritual capital he makes available in the person of the Holy Ghost is domiciled in your spirit. So you will need to exercise your spirit intentionally. 
intentionally in order for the capacities that are locked on your spirit to show forth. Now, are you there? I know, I know. It took you four years to get your university degree. It will take you 10 years to master the spirit, active, spirit potentials that you have in the Holy Ghost. 10 years of deliberate and intentional practice. I say, I say this from experience. I know you are, your heart is broken. Like, ah, how old would I? You, it means you spent all of your life on the wrong things. And I need to tell you tonight, you were chasing shadows. Wake up and learn how to exercise your spirit. Nobody will do it for you. There's no machine you, you, uh, that you can plug it. <laughs> hey, mm, I, I went to Europe and I saw something they were calling the electric car. I, I'm still a scientist, so I tried to calculate how much energy is required to charge that car. Are you following me? Yes. Now, you know these deep freezers that we have in our houses? Imagine 25 deep freezers. That's the amount of energy you need to use to charge an electric car. I knew it was not sustainable, that this world cannot sustain that technology yet. Meanwhile, somebody says he has a, an electric car that he cannot charge. <laughs> Even in the great London that you know, the charging terminals in London can only cater for 25% of the electric cars running on the road. So that is infrastructure-wise. They don't have what it takes to push it. Are you there? Yes, you know, when I notice you are not here, we cut things. It means you need a wilderness to get the information I wanted to give you. Sometimes wilderness of five years, wilderness of two years. That is what you need to bring you into the matter. That, because anytime I want to say it, you will not say, boop, 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 boop. you mean, ah! It's wilderness, wilderness therapy is what is. <laughs> they don't have enough charging points for the electric cars in the United States. As meticulous as they are, as as, 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 as brainy as they are, they, were, they did not provide infrastructure. They said they want to phase out gasoline vehicles and let every vehicle that drives on the roads of England be um, electric vehicle. But they don't have... They don't have the charging capacity. But in the Holy Ghost, we have a personalized charging capacity. And uh, the average believer doesn't want to charge his own vehicle. In the UK, they are looking for charging points for their cars. We, you have a personalized one, <laughs> and you, you, you refuse to charge it. And you are expecting that you reap the dividends of a charge system. Some of you, when you come to ministries like this where we pray, you know people don't like prayer again. In fact, a whole doctrine was built around allergy to prayer by people that are in senior positions in the labors of the gospel in the body of Christ. I believe it's a strategy from the kingdom of darkness to make us walk on crutches. Because I have studied the apostolic community. Are you with me? I studied the apostolic community. They had a four-point agenda. One item of the agenda among the four was prayer. That means when you come into their community, they will afflict you with prayer enough. If you survive, that if you, if you remain, it means you are accepted that, okay, we are sentenced to prayer. And if you cannot cope with prayer, go. But their agenda never changed. You are not with me. Imagine 120 people that came and encountered God in the upper room. The first message that was preached after that empowerment. Are you there? Yes, 3,000 people were added to the church. Um, excuse me. If the original people are 120, and the people that joined them are 3,000, and this, they could not overpower the culture of the 120 people. Think about it. 
You are not, you are not following. Think about it. You, we sent you for youth service. You got lost. You got, you backslid for one year. You are from Plateau. They sent you to, to Bauchi, to Toro here. Toro. <laughs> we, we had to conduct deliverance. Demons were coming out of your soul. Demons were coming out. <laughs> That's what happens when people refuse to use their charger, personalized. It will take you 10 years of use for you to be able to realize the true potency of your human spirit galvanized by the Holy Ghost. The devil made it such that believers are comfortable doing every other thing except praying. But if you are going to see the power of the spiritual capital that has been invested inside of you. Are you there? Yes, you will learn how to intentionally and deliberately exercise your spirit. You learn how to deliberately and intentionally exercise your spirit. You know, I said once, if you are 21 years old and you have not prayed for 10 hours in tongues before, you are, you are a comic figure. Like, you are like Batman. Like this. <laughs> because what? The, mm. So what you are setting yourself up to becoming is that your soul will become more developed than your spirit. When your soul, if I hear a pastor preach, I can know what is more developed in him. You can't change those people you are preaching to from the soul. No. I've done that before. Uh, are you following what I'm talking about? In our days on campus, let me say this with all humility. I had very strong cerebral powers. Exceptionally strong brain. So, I know what I, ha I achieved with brain. And then when we now, <laughs> we sense the call, came into ministry, I was still using brain. Uh, you know, I'm, there was a time I crammed, <laughs> I could quote the scriptures like people that do karatu. <laughs> yeah. I used brain. And I was able to prove to so many people that I was an intellectual in scripture. But their lives did not change. Yes, their lives didn't change. So just in case you, you like that method, I've, I've done it. It, it produced confusion. After, after four years, there was so much confusion. It was Satan that visited. <laughs> and you know what? If you are not intentionally exercising your spirit, Satan will throw you into confusion. You, he, he will show you how limited that your cerebral power is. That it is, it is totally handicapped when you are confronted with a situation that is orchestrated from the realm of the spirit. So God deliberately decided to create us with infirmities, with weaknesses, with insufficiencies. Because he knows our pride. He knows that we will depend on our brain. So he made the brain to be limited. He knows you will depend on your biceps. This is your hand. That, hey, hey, hey. So he will show you circumstances that's why malaria fever is still allowed today to quench the, the muscles and you, you'll be home. That's the reason why they still allowed it. <laughs> to show you that this is your muscles. That small thing can neutralize it. So the psalmist says that I will look onto the hills from whence cometh my help. So that's the posture of Anthropos. The Greek word for man is Anthropos, the creature that was created to look upward. Now, you see, that word was formulated. It was formulated based on the relationship of the sun to the moon, because the moon does not have light in itself. The light that it reflects is a light that it gets from the sun. So if you are an Anthropos, you don't have light in yourself, but it is the light of God that you see that you can reflect. You are a reflector. You are not a generator. You are a 
reflecting. It's what I encounter in God that my life can reflect. And if I've encountered nothing, I will reflect flesh. The earlier you begin to make it a serious business for you to exercise your spirit, the better for you. Your life will switch from the first breath into the second breath. A new context will become the basis of your, of your, of your existence. Um, you know, many of us, maybe you have not been in battles where people promised you that you will see. Maybe you have not been in that situation. And not empty threats. The people, the people telling you you will see actually know the spirit realm on the other side. And they worked in that realm sufficiently long enough to know that it is potent. The reason why they have not yet born again is because that one they are doing is working. <laughs> you are not with me. <laughs> you are. are you there? Okay, so when you are confronted with such a person or such people, you now discover that my certificate, yes, I made a first class, but first class can. You used to go to the gym and you can raise in 5 kg. You know that that cannot. Then you'll be forced to exercise your spirit. If you don't know the way of the spirit, what is generated, the electricity that is generated when you run the dynamo of your spirit and what you can use that electricity to achieve, ah, then you are going to, you are likely to become a victim in that warfare. And the reason for your becoming a victory is not that the power is absent, it's just that you have, you are ignorant of the system, is working modalities. The reason why God gave us the Holy Ghost as the proof of our regeneration is because human life is spiritual. So you need to grow in spiritual things. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the way we have knowledge of spiritual things is experience. Unfortunately. A lot of us would have loved it to be maybe cerebral. Uh, this my Bible study, what it will do for you is to give you an insight into what to expect on the platform of experience. So that when you step and decide that you are going to leave this place and intentionally Begin to exercise your spirit. You already know what to expect. What to expect. This is how it is. That's how it is. But my lecture will not replace the place of your own personal adventure in the spirit. Are you there? Yes, you have never seen a vision before? Why not try praying for 10 hours? The ability to see visions is in an energy level in the spirit that you need to exercise your spirit to arrive at. If you have never arrived at that point, you will claim that some things don't exist. Not because they don't exist. It's because they don't exist for you at the level that you want to do business. Because some people don't want to do business in deep waters. They want to play at the shore, dive. That place where, that's where they want to. And if you decide that that's where you want to operate, we will not stop you. There's, there's life. There's sufficient life there. At least at that point, you can take your bath. You can wash stuff out. You can wash clothes. That's an activity. Say, that's, we, can't, we can't give you a vision if you are not willing to be conceived of one. But just know, don't lie and say, visions don't exist. No, you are lying. Because where you are, they don't exist where you are. But there are other places where other things exist. And that's why the Bible says that in Christ, there are places but you will need to migrate in order to enter into places where experiences are hidden. Exercise your spirit. Exercise your spirit. 
Exercise your spirit. Exercise your spirit. The more you exercise your spirit in prayer, the more the ability to pray comes on you. The more the grace. It's just like, like I told you yesterday, if you, were, if you were born several years ago and then they decide to tie your right hand and put it to your back, strap it to your back. After 16 years, they decide to release it. You, you will be crippled on that hand because you never used it. So we have issues of, of paralysis, strange types, different types of spiritual paralysis that is going on. Somebody say, I can't hear God. It's a sign of paralysis. So they've been, they've tied, the spirit is tied. Ah! So even though in conferences like this, we release fire, all the chains are burnt off, but when the hand comes out, it is, it is lifeless. We need to subject it to physiotherapy. So much heat. If there is any blood left, let it flow. Oh my God. Oh my God. When will you wake up from your paralysis? Those crutches you've been using in the spirit. Eh? When will you... <sighs> Until you decide to migrate into that level of civilization, your life will not progress beyond this point. It will not. It will not progress beyond this point. It will not progress beyond this point. I was praying my own kind of prayer. Huh? I'm praying for some issues. And the things were not happening. I said, God, what is happening? I've been praying. He said, yes, you've been praying. But it's just like fuel. That's God teaching me now. Say you want to travel to just from, from your city. And you decide that you cannot afford more than 20,000 naira for it. So because you now, you have dictated how many hours of prayer you are willing to pray. So you just peg it there. That means you don't want to arrive. Because the car will still be in good shape, but the fuel will finish. And may God help you for the fuel not to finish in the den of oh, bandits. <laughs> hey. May it not finish at the doorpost. He said, so you come to me, you, are, you want to travel with me, and you have determined in your heart that this is the amount of fuel. I'm going to do only two hours. Okay. You will break down many times, and if bandits are around the vicinity of your second breakdown, you will have another prayer point. The prayer point will no longer be, let's arrive just. The prayer point now will, will change. <laughs> you might need the deliverance. You might need intervention. Prayer points, are, they change when people are not, uh, they ration with God. Have you ever prayed before until the Holy Ghost released you? Do you know the experience of being released? Okay, you have enough fuel. Go and implement the things for which I've empowered you to do. Unfortunately, brethren, if you are going to maximize that second breath, it's prayer. Okay, so let's move on. Now you are back from the market, so we can continue this our discussion. So Jehovah Elohim was the one that gave the first breath. Jehovah Elohim gave the second breath in John chapter 20, verse 20. He gave the first breath in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Turn your Bible with me. You know, I said you should come with me to the book of Psalms 110. When you see a man... That, I, that is relatively an old Christian. He's been around for five years, seven years, and he's still living in immorality. One of the symptoms, one of the reasons is because he refused to exercise his spirit.
if you exercise in your spirit, you will overcome sin. Oh, you see somebody that is always confused. I mean, why you can be anointed and confused. That person has the diagnosis is that he's not been exercising his spirit. You see somebody that has inferiority complex. When he comes among people, if he becomes, you know what? He doesn't know himself. He's lacking in the knowledge of his identity because he has not exercised his spirit. The Bible says that in him, everything consists. It means that the meaning of everything can be found in him. I was born with facial palsy. So I'm not the most handsome of men because of my, my impediment, right? So I've not closed this eye before uh, since I was born. But it doesn't affect my self-esteem. I stood before professors and I opened the scriptures and they went to their pastor and asked him to tell that man to reduce the intensity. Yes. Yes. Including the professor that was the, my project supervisor in the university. He was in that congregation. That's the highest number of professors and doctors I've had to address. It was a 5,000 member strong congregation. What I was saying was not what I learned in the classroom. I got that sense of my being when Jesus whispered to me and told me what he had crafted me to do on the earth. Hallelujah. The other day some people said they wanted to kill me. You know why I will not be killed? Because that thing that Jesus called me to do, he didn't call so many people to do it. Are you there? Meanwhile, it's not as if I'm afraid of death like that. I don't hold too tightly to this life. Because I've seen the glory of God. I've seen something better than this estate. I've seen something better than this. And I saw these things in the place of prayer. I saw what Jesus was willing to give me after this life. And there was no promotion on earth that could come close to it. So I'm not ready for any earthly promotion that will eclipse what Jesus showed me. That he is willing to give to me in his kingdom. You will lack conviction if you don't exercise your spirit. You start doing hook up, hook up in just if you don't exercise your spirit. You become a creature of the generation. You will steal like every other person. You will chase people's wives like every other person. And, even, and if you are a pastor, you will sleep with members that God has given you to, to ship. I have seen the glory of God. I've seen it. I've seen where Jesus, where Jesus, the place he offered me in the kingdom of God. And he told me that if I can be faithful. He gave me the same instructions he gave Jeremiah. Do not be afraid of their faces. Oh, you must have seen that, that people have been, have been insulting me since last year, February. <laughs> the more they insult, the more my sleep, my, my sleep has been improving. <laughs> <coughs> because I'm in the service of Jesus. He's my first audience. The person insulting me on Facebook was not there when Jesus called me. I don't serve him. I'm not in his service. Are you there? 
Oh my God, if Jesus comes to me in the night and says, go and say this to this person, I'm the first person. I will be at his doorpost in the morning. Thus said the Lord. The, the exact words I will tell him. If I die after that, so be it. If that was how he planned it. The reason why I will not shake is because I have seen the glory of God. If you see the glory of God, it doesn't erase. It lives with you as a close companion, like your own beating heart. I've had opportunities to have money. The kind of money that is an abomination to have. But it will, it will be at the cost of a little compromise, just a little. But I couldn't do that to Jesus. In London, 24 hours, Satan appeared to me three times and pleaded with me to help him. Three times in 24 hours. Say, I, I built a temple and I need seven sacrifices to activate it. I've done six and you are blocking the seventh one. Satan, he came three times in 24 hours. For your information, those pictures you see in nursery school about Satan that he has horns is not true. He's the most handsome creature I've ever seen. He doesn't stammer. You know how we stammer? He's fluid. You will believe him if you hear him talk. And he's very, very self-controlled. Doesn't get angry easily. Doesn't show his anger easily. Persuasive. Three times in 24 hours. And I told him I will not serve you. Because I've seen the glory of God. So when you see people that are not rooted in their convictions, they can play. <laughs> you know what? They have not exercised their spirit enough to see his glory. No, they have not. To see his glory. I went to a nation to preach and then they organized a dinner and brought one of the contestants for presidency in that nation into the deal. I didn't even know that the team would now go. Uh, so I thought it was a closed meeting where we could say the truth. So before we came for that meeting, I, I looked for Jesus. I woke up 12, in the 12 midnight. I said, are you there? By 3 a.m., he started talking to, to me. He said, that man you are going to meet will be the next president of this country. Meanwhile, politically, it was... It was impossible. Impossible because they are, the whites handed over the leadership of that nation to three families. The guy was not in that family. Was not among the three. And at the, as at the time that I was talking with him, he was partyless because they expelled him from his party. So we came to the place and I said, you are David. That's the name Jesus called him in the night. You are David. And I told him that he was going to win. Blah, 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 blah. It was that prophecy that he wanted to give up that money. It was that prophecy that made him. So he went on to win. And I was invited. The, that nation invited me for the inauguration of that president. When I saw the preachers that were present in the inauguration. I did not use the hotel that they gave me. May the Lord give you understanding. When, when I saw the preachers that were sitting huh, in that inauguration, because I know all of us will be in that whole hotel, I stayed with a friend. Because Jesus did not plan for me and these ones to meet in the whole of my lifetime.
Now, if I had stayed in the hotel, they would have come to look for me in the night to say, to take me to the, um, what they call it, the villa. In fact, the next day, my appointment to be in the presidency was 9 a.m. And I had minister's conference. So I went and prayed. I said, cancel this meeting. So one of the, I've never seen so many presidents gather like that. One of the presidents barged into my own slot. And that was how I couldn't. So they now say, okay, that thing will not work. So I went for my minister's conference. And when I escaped, nobody knew. Because the one that gave those words did not ask me to see anybody. In fact, I asked to ask my father in the Lord, should I go on this trip? He says, a great honor now. Go. That was why I go. I, I, I went. If not, I wouldn't. I have seen the glory Jesus wants to give me. There's nothing any man alive that is, that is drawing breath to keep his flesh alive can give me in exchange of that glory. No. When you go deep enough, your convictions will take root. You will become grounded. Nothing can blow you away. The philosophy of the Gensayas will be weak because you are already doing business in deep waters. Your life, the meaning of your life is beyond space and time. You become an excuse. For which God will set his feet in the earth to bring to pass some of the cancers that have been suspended. Oh my God. Oh my God. Just like Abraham. Abraham was God's excuse to do so many things. Many years after he was gone. See, I will do this because of Abraham, my servant. That's how I want to be. Are you there with me? Oh, Jesus. The Lord has not allowed me liberty to tell you things I've seen in heaven. Not every preacher preaches from the pulpit. Some preach from heaven. Let me see if I can run away from this glory that is forming here so that I can show you number three. Are you with me? Come with me to Psalms. Psalms 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thine footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst. Of thine enemies. Thine people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now. Let's add one more scripture. So that I can close my Bible. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where they were sitting and they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat on upon each of them and they were filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with all the tongues as they Spirit gave them 
altars. Okay. David operated in so many capacities. Operated in the capacity of a prophet. Operated in the office of a king. Operated in the office of a priest. He was also the sweet psalmist of Israel. So when you read any psalm, you must understand which office is speaking. The psalm that we just read, it was obviously operating the capacity of a prophet because it was peeping into hallowed antiquity. He saw a scenario in the administration of the kingdom of heaven where the father was making a promise to the son. And those of us that now that we are Christians, believers, New Testament functionaries, it is easy for us to place that vision within the context of chrono chronology because it was after Jesus ascended into the heavens that he was received up and he sat at the right hand of God. So the scenario that um, David saw was the time after which Jesus had satisfied the claims of divine justice and he was received into the heavens. When he was received into the heavens, the Bible reveals that the Father offered him an executive position. That was what the Bible called right hand. If you read med medieval novels and books, you will see the registers and the, and the terminologies that were used in the kingdom era, in the days of kings. When we say someone is the man of my right hand, which is Benjamin, the son of my right hand. Okay, I know you with me. All right, so let's leave it. Let's leave it. Let's leave it. So Jesus was offered an executive position. He said, sit down at my right hand. Sit in the place of administration. Sit in the capacity of an administrator. And it will be my responsibility to bring your enemies to your feet. So the father was making a promise to the son. So now that you have accomplished redemption, your ministry in heaven is about to begin. If you study the book of Ephesians very well, it took him 17 years to write the book of Ephesians after he went to the wilderness of Arabia for three and a half years for honeymoon. Paul was the only one that gave his life to Christ and went for honeymoon with his, his Lord, went to seek him out diligently for three and a half years. When he came back from Arabia, he came back a colossus. He had had so many encounters, many of which there, were, there was no utterance for him to unveil. He dropped prayer points across the churches he planted that they should ask the Lord to grant him utterance to be able to communicate the mysteries that he saw in Arabia. It took 17 years of prayer for him to have the utterance to write the book of Ephesians. One of the things that is captured in the book of Ephesians is the heavenly ministry of Jesus. He finished his earthly ministry. He was received into the heavenly. Paul revealed to us a certain throne. A certain throne of administration that was situated far above the influence of principalities, of powers, of dominion. And every name that is named of things on earth, of things in heaven, and of things beneath the earth. That means there is no office, there is no majesty that is as high as that high. In fact, the location of his throne in Zion. Because Zion is the administrative headquarters of God. His throne is pitched 
at the point in heaven that has the highest topography. Study the book of Ephesians. In the topography of heaven, the highest peak is where his throne is. You can't miss his throne if you, if you, if you walk the streets of heaven. The highest peak. And the reason why his throne was situated there is because his administration is supposed to feel and manipulate all things. It is the throne, that throne that manipulates everything according to the counsel of the will of God is the throne that he has. For instance, you were not asked to be born as a plateau man. I know you would have chose China. <laughs> Hallelujah. You would have desired to be a German. But in all those heavy matters, you were not consulted. You are a victim of a throne, an administration. You manifested at the time where the Naira doesn't have value. I know you would have wanted to come in, in the 70s. Where, where they say they buy a car. How, how much it was the jolt then? Huh? <laughs> you were not consulted because a throne, the throne of significant majesty was involved. It was according to his own will that, that it became. Are you there? It was that throne that the father was speaking about that the son was going to be ushered in. The bearer of that throne has a name that is higher than every other name. The Christ. I know you like telling stories that you gave your life to Christ on a certain day. And I, I chose Jesus. When we get to eternity, the story will be different. Because the reason why you have remained a Christian is not because you chose Jesus. The reason why you have remained a Christian is because he upholds all things by the word of his power. It is by his own faith that you have kept a Christian for 20 years, for 15 years, for 10 years. Paul said, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So you say you have great faith, You, you are existing in the Lord because of his own faith. So you're the one that upholds you. Just like creation came into being because he spoke, you are upheld in your faith in him because his authority is upholding you. There is nothing in the new creation that survives of itself. It survives because that administration has been set up. Oh my. If you, if in your lifetime, God gives you the privilege of seeing the glory of that throne, your life will change forever. You will know that there's nothing left on it. There are some of those encounters, you will need to have a good wife for you not to translate. When you look back and say, ah, this one has not done me any harm, I will stay, I will stay, I will stay. <laughs> A time came in the ministry of Paul. Paul says, see, see, see I, 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 that, uh, no, I, I, uh, I want to go. But for your sake, it's more profitable. I've checked it. It's more profitable for your sake for me to remain. There are things that you see that your soul becomes rapturable. You don't desire anything of that. You, be you become more creature of heaven done of it and the only place you can find peace is on your knees in the place of prayer 
That's the only place you can find peace. I say, come and go to America. Oh my God, America. I would rather go to heaven and peep again at the realities. The mountains that glister. Oh, oh, oh. I saw the garments of the saints, how they were, how they were glowing. And when it was announced that Jesus was coming, all their glows became like darkness in the midst of the light that his countenance gave. No wonder in that city there's no need for the light of the sun. It's, it's an insult. Say, for the Lamb himself shall be the light of that city. I saw that light. you know I was telling you a story in one of the southern African countries when I came out like this from the stadium to minister to people that were outside there were like 15,000 people outside the stadium was filled up and witches began to curse me bitter curses bitter, bitter, bitter oh my god so I lifted up my hands as he instructed all the, the <laughs> it was that light that came out. Sit down at my right hand. He said, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So the question we need to ask is, how does the father intend to fulfill his promise? Verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So the way he will fulfill the promise is that he will send the rod of his strength out of Zion. The Holy Ghost will need to leave the administrative headquarters and go into the earth. It will interest you to know that this scripture was the scripture that Peter quoted as a justification for the day of Pentecost. The back end of Pentecost. In quoting this scripture, he was saying that Pentecost did not begin from the upper room. It began from the throne room. Are you there? So, we are still... Are you, are you following me? Do you still remember... That the, the one that breathes is Jehovah Elohim. He breathed on man in uh, Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. It was the breath of life. He breathed on, on his disciples in John chapter 20 verse 20. It, it was the breath of the spirit. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. But now he was in heaven. He had moved into heaven. Are you there? Moved into heaven. So he was sitting on this throne. And that's why I read the account of the day of Pentecost. Do you realize that on the day of Pentecost, before the Holy Ghost came down, eh, what happened? There was a rushing mighty wind. It means he breathed from heaven again. Oh, I don't have time. Yeah, come on. There were things, there were things that angels desired to look into but they, it was kept from them. It was kept from them. Okay. There was a sound and the Bible told us where the sound came from. It didn't come from the Atlantic Ocean. It came from heaven. Because Jehovah Elohim was now in heaven. There was another breath that humankind has to have. Just like he received the breath of life. He received the indwelling dimension. And the place from whence he went. Before he gave that last breath. Is significant of what he wants, wanted the breath to achieve. You are not following me. Come to Romans. Come to Romans quickly.
Romans chapter 10 verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in your heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. So there. Are you there? Did you get that? I'll still read another scripture. Um, give me Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5. For one Lord, okay, 4 verse 4, 4 verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all all and through all and in you all and unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of christ then verse 8 is an explanation of verse 7 wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men now listen jesus had those gifts but jesus had to ascend on high after that them that were held captive in hades were losing from their bounds he was already victor there was no arguing of his capacity because Satan surrendered by the military protocol called Aquedomai in Greek. His authority was no longer contended, but he ascended into heaven first before he gave gifts unto men. Those gifts came from heaven. So the question, and you know this wind that he breathed, there was a rushing mighty wind from where so why did he have to wait till he went to heaven before he, he gave <laughs> from there it is from there that he gave you the calling of a prophet it is from there that they give you the ordination of an apostle from there. Because by the time he resurrected, there was no battle to fight. Resurrection was the proof of the fact that he was a victor. But he did not give the gifts from resurrection. He ascended first. It was from ascension. You know, there was a breath he gave after resurrection. That breath he gave after resurrection was the power he was giving us that had power over death he gave us after he conquered death it means that if you have that depth indwelling dimension of god on your inside you too you will rise from the dead and you will be a spaceman that death will still be conquered because what he gave you was the resources the resources available to him for which he was able to conquer death he gave you that one then there were other things that he refused to give you after resurrection. He now. It is because of the things he gave you from ascension. That you are more than a conqueror. And I will explain what it means tomorrow. To take us. Like one hour, 30 minutes. To know what it means when we say. You are more than. In heaven, his far opposed principalities and powers, his authority is not challenged. 
In heaven, God has the liberty to exercise his authority to the fullest extent. In heaven, his will is done. In heaven, his kingdom has been established. The same way he is hoping that it will be established on earth, it's already established in heaven. So if you want to know what he wants to do on earth, take a glimpse. Take, check heaven. So he released that breath. From his throne as the ruler of all the universe. That's the third level of the dominion mandate. It is that dimension that establishes us as rulers on earth. Are you there? Nobody ascended onto the throne in Israel until he was anointed. But the Bible says that ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. There will be an anointing that will come upon you. And this power, are you there? Then he mentions territory. The next thing after the anointing of Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is territory. Jerusalem. Judea. Samaria. Should I ask you a question? If you are not ruling now, the challenge might be that you don't know the territory you were called to rule. <laughs> are you there? If you are not reigning now, it might be that you don't know the territory you were called to reign because you cannot, there can't be two kings in a terrain. So I found out my own place in the kingdom. So the anointing that is at work on my life is to provide evidence, to provide do dominion evidence. That means I'm going to meet enemies of the kingdom that I represent. But what I have is sufficient to match them down. After the third breath, there must be evidence that you are exercising dominion. It doesn't matter what hell unleashes. The vengeance and the bitterness of the curses on the heart of devils. The throne that empowers me is a throne that is higher than every throne. Sealing my stature for dominion in the earth. In the office, when I was still, I was still working, 30 people gathered and said, they will mess me up. And all of them are not of our faith. In the whole of that depot in Gombe, at a certain time, I was the only Christian. So 30 men said they want to deal with me. Then I went to Jehovah Sabuat. <laughs> the man of war. And I stayed with him for three days. Do you know that God can create a problem? That will be greater than the need to pursue you. <laughs> oh, even if it's a president that finds you, go there. He, is he not a mortal man? He needs to take oxygen into his lungs. What if his lungs reject all oxygen? A strange trouble struck. After when I woke up from my knees on the third day, I took my bag and I headed there.
many people believed I was in a very terrible court till I resigned. I said, no, he's in something. Do you realize, do you realize that the son of an imam was struck with demons and they had to tell them that there's one man at the depot that can revive him? Yes. I, I refused to preach in Gombe. That is, I didn't accept any invitation to preach because my assignment in Gombe was that of intercession. And I did it day and night. There were visions I saw. I knew I was not a preacher there. It was an undercover mission. And I tell you the truth, there is a door that is open over that state. You will see evidences of my labor. I labored there for four years, six months as an intercessor, not as a, as a preacher. I never accepted any invitation because that was not why I was there. The people assisting me in the office were Muslims. One of them then came to me, I, I know you are a man of God. So I don't know in which context, but that my wife is barren. I said, give me your hand. I shook him. I said, take this hand and touch your wife's stomach when you get back. Before my eyes, he conceived and gave birth to a son. That guy whose wife delivered was the one that came to leak the secret to me that people want to give. Because of his closeness to me, they wanted to deal with him too. I said, stand with me. There is a wind that follows me. It will cover you. For four years, six months, until the Lord said I should turn down my and that's where I resigned from. The gate of hell could not prevail. There's a wind in me that is from heaven. This wind in me comes from a throne that has established authority. Nothing is contending with the authority of that throne that released this wind. Oh my. So nothing short of dominion will be the story of my life. If, if people don't marry in your family, you will marry. Oh. People never prosper among your people. Your own case will defy the law. Yeah. There were people that never shaked me again until I left because they believed I was neck, neck deep in spiritism. Because the things that they did to come to make me kneel, none of it worked. And unfortunately, it was just one man there, so but they are not aware of the legions. The legions, the legions, the legions, the legions, the legions, the legions. I say I saw Satan. I did not bow to him. So it's not a human being I will not see and be afraid. <laughs> There is a wind. It came on the day of Pentecost. It's to establish kings, establish rulers of spheres, rulers of territories, rulers of, of spheres of human endeavor. It will establish dominion in every capacity, in every realm where God sends men. We were checking the records the other day. We have been to 87, on 87 missions, international missions. 
1,015 cities. 1,015 cities. And in all these cities, there was nothing too strong that did not bow to us. 1,015 cities, 87 missions. So I'm not telling you theory. I'm telling you practicals. In Scotland, the Indians came for our meeting. And they came with a boy that was deaf, 25 years old boy, deaf and dumb from bed. And the mother was dead and the father was dead. And I was preaching, I was preaching. And I said, everyone that has problem with deafness, I prayed for the rest and they began to hear. I prayed for him. When I prayed for him, I saw he was deaf and dumb. I prayed for him, he did not hear. I, I told the congregation, I'm interested in this case. It's not, God may not be interested, but me, I am interested. And I prayed for him again, he did not hear. I prayed for him the third time, he began to hear, but he could not speak. I prayed for him the fourth time, he began to speak and he began to hear. I will talk, he will talk, I will talk, he will talk. The whole place scattered. We couldn't share the grace. People began to cry. We, they had to smuggle me through another way out to go out because people began to cry. That was how the hearts of men opened. You go somewhere and God will do a notable miracle. Boom! Somebody that is, has been crippled for 23 years will start working. And the hearts of men will open. We use that one to draw them to the kingdom of God. One hundred, one thousand and fifteen times. So what we are saying is not a lie. You can rise up from that place where you've been subjugated, and you can become the prince that God has ordained you to be. Oh, God told the angel told Jacob. He said, "Like a prince, now you have emerged. You have emerged like a prince. Like a prince, thou hast." Power with God, and thou has prevailed. Oh, she had my good day. Um, we are going to pray. I am seeing princes walk on foot, and servants ride on horseback, and that has been the tale over Nigeria for a very long time. But in our lifetime, that that anomaly under the sun will be corrected in our lifetime in our lifetime in our lifetime in our lifetime restore the princess restore the noblemen restore the sons and the daughters of Zion oh shh Restore, restore. Let them ride on horseback. Let their honor be restored. Restore the honor of ministers in Nigeria. Restore our voice. Restore. Put an end to this anomaly. Oh my God. The days that we walked on foot. And were humiliated by the intensity of the sun. Those days have been numbered. And those days are ended. Oh my. Oh my. I want you to pray with me. For a moment of time. Because we want to come against the anomaly. For how long will princes walk on foot? For how long will servants ride on horseback? For how long? For how long will the nobles cease to sit at the gates? For how long will the elders be dispersed? For how long will the walls be broken asunder? Restore. 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 Let the cry of the princess be restored. Let the chants of the musicians 
them that sing to your glory let it be restored let the music of the young men come again in the city restore the terror that travels with the voice of your messengers Aniko Babunala Shaiko Preskete Kude Ruma Sekilai Tokobe Babondele Lahuske Tembro Hobor Puria Basiko Praminaite Kovosi Selete Escobronde Kabuga Baguda Siko Praminaita Oh Restore Restore there is a glory that was deposited on your life oh, we want to see his fullness we want to see his possibility we want to see his splendor yelemon seke ruba man selibongo bakuske laiko malaba Rabba Sontelia, a Kobe Manzeli, a Broske Tendo Kobe Babunda. Hey! Restore! Restore! The staff of your princes, restore! The voice of your prophets, restore! Restore! Restore the power! Of your handmaids, the strength of the daughters of Zion, restore. Restore the We have walked on the sidelines for too long. We have walked without the strength of our masculinity. But we were ordained to be the crowned ones with glory and with honor. Look upon your inheritance again and strengthen your people. For the servants ride on horseback and the princes wander on foot. The heritage of your people is being stolen. The sons of violence have plundered us. There is wailing, there is mourning, there is weeping on our streets, and even our young have become widows. Restore, restore, restore. I forbid. Is God a coolie breaker, Boko Tama? Is this not the plateau, the beauty of Nigeria, the place that has the covenant of peace? Restore, restore. For the sons of Anak are in the land. The sons of abomination. Walk among the people. Restore. Ilebosheke. Mandalia sike. Robaskido. Ambekusa kabakoda. Adali komba selaki. Elebros kombele. Abumenanteli. Heza koria. Restore, restore, princes walk on food, restore, scratching around, scratching around for survival, restore. Restore, oh Prince of Peace, we call upon him. Aya 
Old Testament. Ante Cosino Monde Le Tama La Baba Coro Passi Cosqueto Engo Manisco Pecadilla Isco Gronde Babatala We stand on the plateau On the highest topography of our landscape and our nation And we say let your deliverance begin from here Come to the mountain top. Give a new covenant to your people on the plateau. Take our mourning away. Take our lamentation away. Send in no more Korea. For it is written that you are known by the judgments that you execute. Thunder, thunder, thunder from above. Thunder, thunder upon this nation. Thunder upon this nation. Send the flames of fire.
name of Jesus. Listen. As we prayed, I beheld, and lo, in the spirit I saw a candle. A candle was born in, in the spirit. And in the moment of time, a wild wind came and put off the light. And the Spirit of the Lord whispered to me that this candlestick is someone that ruled this nation before. But it shall come to pass that when his light shall be extinguished, that my deliverance program for Nigeria will begin. Amen. A candle shall be put out in the days to come. Amen. And that shall be a sign of the seasons of my intervention. Amen. For I will come, says the Lord. I will come and I will not tarry, says the Lord. My coming shall be with fury, with justice, and with judgment. And there is no iniquity that will not be recompensed. I will come, says the Lord, and I will come speedily. Watch for the sign of the candlestick. Watch for the sign of the candlestick, says the Lord. In the name of Jesus.